Hello and welcome to Dialogue. China has delimited and announced the baselines of the territorial sea adjacent to Huang Yan Do in the South China Sea, a move that followed the Philippines' new laws defining its own marine boundaries and international sea rules in the area. What brought about the announcement? How does China mark the baseline of its islands in the South China Sea? And how may these Philippine laws impact the situation in these waters? Join us for our discussion today, live from Beijing. I'm Xu Qinduo. Joining me today are Rong Ying, Chair Professor at Sichuan University and a Senior Research Fellow from China Institute of International Studies, Professor Anna Rosario Malindo Wai, a Director and the Vice President for External Affairs of the Asian Century Philippines Strategic Studies Institute. And later on, we'll also be joined by Yang Li, uh, Executive Director of the Institute for China Europe Studies. Welcome to Dialogue. So, Rongying, I will start with you. The Chinese side made the announcement and about the delimiting of this uh, Huang Yan Dao or Huang Yan Island in the South China Sea. So, h- tell us uh, wh- why, you know, how you explain. You know, could you explain what exactly this means? Well, I think the uh, statement by the Chinese Foreign Ministry made it very clear that, uh, uh, according to Chinese uh, viewpoint. Uh, Huang Yan Dao has been the integral part of China, and China has solid uh, historical and legal ground. And uh, in uh, accordance with the uh, uh, international law, including anchors, which I think uh, uh, the principle of dominant domination or the land dominates the sea decides, and also uh, in according to with China's uh, relevant law, the territorial, I mean. Uh, uh, seas related to that. I think it is all, only appropriate and then the turn the normal practice for China to make the announcement to define clearly uh, its uh, so, uh, territorial seas related to uh, Huang Yan Dao. And I think it conforms certainly the international practice and also I think uh, uh, has legitimate and reasonable and justified. And of course, a uh, lot of uh, analysis has been going on, the context, the backdrop of this announcement. But I, I think that uh, while I would like to make very clear and also echo the, uh, by echoing the uh, foreign minister's statement that it is a normal practice, I think to some extent it is personally, I believe, related to the uh, le- recent uh, sort of uh, moves by the Philippine side. Uh, in terms of the enactment of the two uh, sort of acts, the Maritime uh, Zone Act and also the uh, uh, Maritime uh, Sea Lane uh, uh, Acts, uh, which I think China believe and China has uh, launched a strong uh, opposition and a protest against that. But I think China, the way the Chinese uh, responded is still very much uh, restrained. And I think uh, uh, it also sent a, a very strong signal on the one hand that it would like to uh, continue to uh, safeguard certainly I mean, uh, territorial integrity and maritime rights. But in the meantime, it's also ready uh, to work with uh, the uh, Philippines for a p- proper settlement of that. Last but not least, I think it also sent a very strong signal that because uh, with the clear defined sort of uh, uh, territory uh, related to uh, territorial claim related to Huang Yan Dao, Chinese relevant uh, sort of authorities or institution will be able to better implement or enforce related, I mean, or uh, laws related to not only in terms of sovereignty, but the most in, also equally important is like the protection of the environment, ecological systems around that. So this is a normal practice. And this is also, I think, meant to uh, send a strong signal to the Philippine side and international community as a whole. China is uh, wanted to mm-hmm. safeguard its just territorial integrity, but in the meantime, it is ready to work uh, to seek a proper uh, sort of uh, management of uh, I mean, settlement of these disputes. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Anna, how do you make uh, the statement uh, you know, by the Chinese foreign ministry? 
Uh, of course, the announcement came two days uh, after the Philippine side enacting the two laws. Uh, you know, domestic law, of course, is related to these disputes there. Um, thus far, I mean, with the pronouncement of the Foreign Ministry of China, um, and also, of course, it has a strong opposition to the new enacted laws um, signed by President Marcos Jr. recently. I think it's understandable as far as far as I'm concerned, precisely because it's it's it is a known fact that you know China has a sovereignty claims over some of the of some of the parts by which we in the Philippines are also claiming. So in a way, I expect China to have that strong opposition, and of course, it will be vocal about it. And and but on the other hand, the the Philippine government under Marcos Jr. is standing on its of course on its on on saying that you know the it's but legal for the philippine domestically speaking to come up with a law with with these laws precisely because um on the pretext that it is a sovereign state but at the end of the day um you know it, it, it's still a dispute you know because um it there's an overlapping claim be, uh, between the two sides and 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 i think it, this is not only an issue between China and, and the Philippines, because I would presume that um, a country like Vietnam, who that has an overlapping claim with the Philippine claims and even that of that of China's claim, will be will possibly react on on the recent enacted laws made by the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Anna, tell us more about this uh, inaction of these two laws. So, you know, uh, maritime zone and also this international sea lane rules. Um, you know, what, what, what does that exactly mean with, uh, you know, what's the relation? Some people say it's, you know, related to the disputes. Somehow it's using domestic law basically to legalize the claim. Is that the, the sense here? Well, let me explain a little bit about the two um, laws and then I will, I will go on with how I perceive it and what is the implication of that with regard to China and vis-a-vis -vis the other claimant states. The Philippine Congress recently passed two maritime laws, the Philippine Archipelagic Sea Lanes Act and the Philippine Maritime Zones Act, which President Marcos signed into law. If you if you really look at the Philippine Arch Archipelagic Sea Lanes Act, basically it designates specific routes within the Philippine archipelago for foreign vessels like commercial and military ships without prior cl clearance. This law reinforces what you call Philippine sovereignty over its waters, while of course they are saying that it's upholding international navigation rights. But of course China is is reacting to this precisely because it has an overlap with with the areas that China claims under the so-called Nandash line or the Tendash line. On the other hand, if you look at the Maritime Zones Act, it, it is a law that formally delineates the Philippine maritime zones, including its territorial sea, exclusive economic zone, and continental shelf. It reinforces the, the Philippine sovereign rights over these zones per se as per on clause, particularly regarding the right to explore, exploit, and conserve and manage mari marine resources within the EEZ or the exclusive economic zone. So in a way, the Philippines, by be uh, enacting this law, is trying to solidify its claim in the face of competing claims in the South China Sea vis-a-vis China and other claimant states, Southeast Asian claimant states. But of course, I understand that China opposes the law as it considers this maritime zone to be a violation of its claim. And of course, um, the claim of China, as we know, is historical rights and, 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 and in the disputed waters of the South China Sea. Now, the, the, the question here is how, how this impacts internationally. One thing that we have to understand, uh, you know, um, as far as um, regional countries is concerned, um, countries are concerned, so far I have not heard anything favoring us. Oh, but on the other hand, um, the, the United States and its Western allies are supporting these laws thus far. Now, the question is if there would be changes on the ground. So far, none. I don't see that there will be a change on the ground situation. And the, 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 the challenge of this laws, though this is domestic, is how to enforce it given the overlapping claims with China and even with Vietnam. So this is basically the situation vis-a-vis -vis the the two newly enacted laws 
by the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, Ruim, of course, if you look at the moves by Manila, or I mean, if, if other countries follow Manila's uh, example, I mean, every country in disputes with these uh, territories, they can use say, domestic law to legalize their claim. Uh, of course, over cla uh, overlapping claim there. That, that's why in the first place we have a we have a, we have trouble there, and then uh, are we somehow uh, you know deepening these uh, these problems instead of uh, simplifying, instead of uh, making it easy to, to to be resolved? Yeah, I think uh, this is a great question. Uh, from I think the, China, the statement of foreign ministry made of China made it very clear. And first and foremost, I think uh, the. Uh, Philippines territory uh, has been uh, uh, privil I mean, historically decided by the uh, uh, international treaty, uh, like the uh, the Treaty of Paris, and uh, the law, the uh, Maritime uh, uh, Sea Law. I mean, Act includes Huayan Dao and it, uh, and quite a lot of Nansha Island. That is something I think China made very clear it's a serious violation, infringement of China's territory. Uh, secondly, I think China also made it very clear the purpose of enactment of these uh, two uh, acts, in particular, I think the Maritime Act, uh, is meant to so-called implement the uh, two, 2016 uh, arbitral uh, award or ruling which I think China has made very clear at the very beginning, it's not going to accept, it's not going to participate, it's illegal. And, uh, and for the purpose of, of course, for the, according to the Philippine side, uh, of implementing uh, UNCLOS, UN-related, uh, uh, the, the sea, right? Yeah. yeah, that's right. So this is something I think legally uh, uh, not, uh, so the, inter I mean, uh, uh, does not hold the water, but related to your question is it also goes or against or in violation of the declaration of the uh, conduct of the parties in the South China Sea, the DOC, which stipulate clearly that uh, no country uh, 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 that, uh, that, that should uh, expand or complicate the disputes, and this is very much important. It, uh, I think it has played a very important role in helping uh, the region, the Clement states, and the region as a whole to achieve, to work together to achieve a proper management and settlement issues. So I think all in all, China made it very clear the statement, and also, if I can say, the countermeasures uh, related to that is meant to ensure these principles. Uh, these uh, uh, laws will not be violated because in the end, neither side is going to benefit. We are going to see more tensions, uh, more problems, and neither side is going to benefit from that. Mm -hmm. So, Anna, um, yeah, go I ahead. Add, yeah. Yes, okay. Um, when it, with regards to the impact and how it impacts the region and even my country and the relationship between China and the Philippines, thus far I see that this is an added complexity to the to the already challenged bilateral political diplomatic relation between China and the Philippines. Personally, really, if I would be asked about solution to the dispute in the South China Sea, I don't think legalistic solution and strategy would work because at the end of the of the day, even if you have these laws, the the, the really the problem problem there is enforcement. For me, the way I see it, if you really want to settle the South China Sea dispute that it would be peaceful and more stable and secure, not only between the Philippines and China, but the whole region, basically, is to really focus on low politics and not high politics, because this is high politics dynamics. Low politics is more about um, trying to have the joint possible joint cooperation, may it be in oil and gas exploration and ventures, um, joint um, fishery management, joint scientific marine exploration in the South China Sea that all claimant states is China, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, and even Brunei and Taiwan would benefit uh, tangibly. And you would reduce the tension because having this kind of situation at the moment, you can see there's really an escalation of tension between the two countries 
politically speaking and diplomatically speaking. And I don't think it would resolve anything at all. So that's my personal position and perspective on this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Yang Li, welcome to the show. So we were discussing uh, the recent two laws uh, by Manila, you know, how will these laws somehow may, you know, escalate or complicate the situation there because you can say all the claimants, you know, they can say using domestic laws to enhance, to strengthen their claim, to legalize their claim, and then there's no solution because everybody can say, you know, we are following our own laws. So there's no, uh, no way to resolve that kind of disputes uh, in a peaceful manner. What do you make of it? Okay, thank you. Um, actually, in my view, um, every claimant uh, in the Southern Sea, they have their own claims and they have their own positions. So uh, what we need is actually uh, some uh, constructive and creative diplomacy uh, to, uh, to bridge the differences. And uh, maybe, maybe the differences are not so easy to resolve, but they still can find ways to manage the disputes. So it means that, you know, maybe by just like practical provisional arrangements or other, you know, uh, uh, ways of uh, exercising self-restraint. Uh, so as to create a conducive environment uh, for the claimants to finally uh, find a, uh, uh, solutions acceptable, acceptable to all the parties. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Yang Li, obviously, I mean, China is not actually following the, uh, the, 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 the let's say, the practice of the Manila, you know, to enact a domestic law <laughs> to legalize or to enhance its claim of uh, the, uh, you know, the islands in, in disputes over there. China is basically... Uh, reaffirming uh, its baselines to make it more accurate, uh, clearer uh, about the claim there. Uh, so can we say, you know, you mentioned the restraint. I'm thinking the Chinese society is actually exercising a certain degree of restraint in terms of uh, how to solve this problem. Mm, I think uh, by uh, responding to uh, Philippine domestic uh, legislation, uh, I think China is um, uh, exercising self-restraint because China only uh, expressed its opposition uh, to uh, the Philippine legislation and also China uh, has its own way of uh, reacting to this situation by like, announcing the uh, Huang Yandao Base Lines. Uh, but I think uh, for both sides, they still have political will to manage the situation so that I'm relatively uh, uh, optimistic about uh, the future prospect that I think the uh, uh, China and Philippines uh, will uh, sit down and talk between themselves. Uh, and uh, the uh, bilateral uh, channels and the communication uh, mechanisms are still in place. Uh, as long as they have political wills uh, to make full use of that, I think that uh, those mechanisms can uh, play a very uh, uh, constructive role in managing the disputes. Mm -hmm. um, but however, I think China also sent a very strong signal by um, Announcing these countermeasures kind of uh, is that you know um, for any perceived provocations uh, there will be consequences. So I think this is kind of a, 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 a two-pronged approach. Mm -hmm. Two-pronged approach. Uh, Rongying, uh, you know, uh, Yang Li is, is a bit optimistic. You know, we still have room to talk and to solve this problem peacefully. But I have doubts about that. You know, simply because you know if um, the other side has made it into law as part of their territory. I mean, how can you talk with the other party about, uh, you know, solving this territorial disputes issue? Because for me, it seems like it's already non-negotiable. It's a part of the Philippines, they say. And um, I mean, any government, if they agree to somehow uh, a compromise, you know, or concession even, both, even made by both sides, they can be, you know, accused of betraying or violating their national law. Well, yeah, that's certainly a uh, very much uh, concerned. Not only I think to China, uh, one of the claimant state uh, to the South China Sea issue uh, dispute, and also I think uh, 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 to the uh, to the uh, uh, countries, the region. Uh, before I go straight to your uh, questions, I think answer because I think I would like to collect mistake. I think Taiwan is part of China, so from Chinese official positions, it's never been the part. Uh, of this dispute. Uh, coming back to your question, 
I think uh, the Chinese uh, position has been over the past decade since the uh, agreement with signing of DOC has made been very clear. It's kind of a, a proposed advocate a dual track strategy or approach that direct uh, talks by, I mean, uh, 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 negotiations uh, between uh, parties, uh, direct parties, uh, direct party of Clement states, I mean parties. In the meantime, working together with the country and the region as a whole, ASEAN, for building uh, the South China Sea into a sea of friendship, cooperation and peace. And in the meantime, I think DOC has to be effectively implemented. Uh, and uh, in the process, I think the COC, the Code of Conduct of South China Sea, should be uh, sort of negotiated. And that's been going on for several rounds. And the concrete, space, I mean, substantial progress has been have been made. Of course, the difficult challenges remain. So this is the, I think, the idea. This is the approach. And the moves by the uh, uh, Philippine side, particularly regarding, I mean, in the legal aspect, does um, very much complicate this process. And as our Philippine colleagues has mentioned, so it is unnecessary, uh, it is provocative, and make this question very complicated. And uh, does not serve the interest of the, uh, the, uh, the certainly the eyesight at all, but also cause many problems and undermine the efforts. Uh, you cannot uh, sort of uh, unilaterally uh, sort of uh, implement or enact an, a law, a domestic law, uh, to uh, manage or to, uh, uh, that and the disputes, uh, regional uh, disputes or disputes at the regional and international implications. It's not a responsible way. It's not, a, I think, a, a way that would help address uh, and manage the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Anna, I want to raise this um, recent development between China and Indonesia. Um, you know, in the similar situation, yeah. they have overlapping uh, claims and they have uh, agreed to set up this uh, intergovernment uh, joint steering committee to explore and advance relevant cooperation. Um, obviously, there are pledges to uh, remain peaceful and to deal with the issue uh, with bilateral, uh, you know, consent and uh, uh, support. So how do you see such a way of, um, you know, handling bilateral disputes, which is very different, say, let's, between the disputes, uh, um, you know, from the disputes between China and, and, and Manila here? Okay, um, thank you for that question. Um, but, but before I answer your question directly, I would just like to address our Chinese colleague here. Like, I'm very much aware that Taiwan is part of China because of the one China policy. And I think my country, the Philippines, ad adhere to that. What I'm just saying earlier is I, the island of Taiwan is also to a certain extent, you know. Um, but of course, it's part of China, has claim over the South China Sea. On the other hand, with regards to um, the, what, what you're saying, like Indonesia and China came up with that kind of bilateral structure by which it can possibly work together, especially in the, I, I've read certain um, recently that there is such a thing as an kind of joint oil and gas exploration that in between Indonesia and China, which is a very, very pragmatic and a very, um, a progressive approach to the to both countries. I think on the part of the Philippines, it happened before during the presidency of Duterte. And I think there was initiative, there was even an MOU, a mutual um a, 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 a mutual a written understanding that you know um the China and the Philippines would have an a joint and oil gas exploration in this in par, some parts of the South China Sea. There was an even MOU, a, mut, a mutual understanding when it talks about fishery management in the South China Sea and many other um, um, kind of um, arrangement. You no, know, that would help not only mitigate the tension, but actually would forge more cooperation between the two countries. Given this, that it happened before during the 30 time, I think it's not impossible. It's really the political will of the leadership of the two countries. And it's really about thinking not just of your country, but the whole regional situation. Because if there will be tension between the two countries like the Philippines and China over legal matters and over even um, skirmishes in the South China Sea, it affects the whole region. As far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned, um, the solution to the South China Sea really is is trying to push for the code of conduct 
um, uphold, uphold the, the DOC of 2002, and at the same time, strengthen the BCM of the bilateral consultative mechanism. It's very much needed now, given the tension, given all of this that is developed, uh, given all these developments. And I hope, um, I hope really that the two countries would sit down and talk and uh, and, and discuss mm -hmm. how they're gonna move forward and they should at least have a common ground you know it's very important for the philippines and china to find a common ground yes. and it's very important for the two countries to sit down and talk because if you don't talk you just push your agenda it, it does not it just not affect the two countries it affect the whole region and i think that is what most what is very important at the moment to preserve the peace stability and security of the region not just of the two countries because everyone That's is that. affected if these two countries will not have good relations but that is true it's affecting the peace and stability of the whole region uh, so yang li here of course if you compare if you look at the situation you know like uh, uh, indonesia and the, the philippines the difference is of course you have the u.s siding with the philippine uh, u.s supporting the manila basically to challenge china you know of course we have seen tensions increasing since the latter half of last year and uh, indonesia <laughs> let's say, uh, independent country here, uh, and dealing with China, uh, handling the relationship between the two countries. So um, how meaningful is the latest, uh, let's say, uh, example agreement between China and Indonesia uh, to let, not bearing the disputes, but handling their disputes in a very, uh, uh, let's say, peaceful way and focusing on uh, their joint efforts to develop their own economy, their society here? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, actually, I just uh, want to echo uh, what uh, Anna just expressed. I think this um, uh, uh, cooperation, maritime cooperation, oil and gas, is a real good example uh, for the uh, climate countries uh, to address their differences and the disputes in the South China Sea. I think uh, China and uh, Indonesia, their agreement uh, on this kind of cooperation, on uh, uh, maritime joint development, uh, is a, the latest example of, um, actually, uh, I can say it's a very major positive breakthrough for the two countries to manage the situation in the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, although the uh, details of the arrangement has not uh, publicized, uh, but uh, 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 as I read from the uh, joint statement by the two countries, I think the statement uh, was very carefully uh, drafted uh, so as to accommodate uh, uh, the concerns of both sides and also not to prejudice against uh, the position uh, of either side. So I think this is a very uh, good starting point uh, for these countries to uh, push forward uh, this cooperation. Um, and also, uh, I think China and the Philippines, actually, uh, these two countries took the need, uh, took the need of uh, uh, jointly uh, 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 developing or explore, uh, exploring uh, the oil and gas resources mm -hmm. in the South China Sea. Back in uh, 2005, you know, uh, the mm -hmm. oil uh, companies of uh, China and the Philippines, together with uh, that of the Vietnam, uh, they uh, carried out a, a, a tripartite joint uh, seismic undertakings uh, from 2005 to 2008, and also the 2018 uh, MOU, uh, also mentioned by Anna, mm -hmm. uh, which set a very good example uh, for the regional countries mm -hmm. uh, to address the disputes. Uh, I, I think, uh, but... Uh, those documents uh, are still there. So I think uh, mm -hmm. China and the Philippines are in a position uh, to pick them up again and uh, talk seriously about how to proceed. Uh, I think that uh, is the right direction for uh, addressing the such and such issues, uh, as I said, by you know, creative and constructive diplomacy. Uh, uh, diplomacy and also be you know, innovative in how to solve this problem. Um, but working together in a joint way for the benefits of uh, uh, everybody here. Well, with that, we come to the end for today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also uh, watch us on the CGT app on YouTube. Thank you for being with us. I'm Xu Qinduo. See you next time.